Drew McIntyre, WWE champion. How are we? Absolutely fantastic. How are you? Very, very good. Thanks. It's, uh, it's actually it's 27 or 28 degrees here in London. And I know last time you were in Britain, we had you on a hill in the freezing cold. So there's a little bit of, little bit of difference yeah. in how you might remember the British weather. Mildly, where was that weather when I was running around in the yeah, Scottish Highlands in my underpants, <laughs> carrying those barrels around? That's a, it's it's a, a heck of a video, though. A heck of a video, though. Yeah, I was going to my life, but it was worth it. You got to suffer <laughs> for your art sometimes. <laughs> it's going to launch the Hollywood career, isn't it? Uh, we'll see. One day. I'm focused on the, the WWE and the wrestling right now. and <laughs> uh, I keep, I, I'll still pitch my movie on the side. I keep talking about it. You know, Braveheart 2, The Rise of Wallace, where the guy's body parts back together and everyone loves zombies still these days. And he rises as a zombie. So it's like zombie Braveheart, Braveheart 2, The Rise of Wallace. Make that movie. <laughs> I'll be in it. <laughs> uh, how, how have you found uh, the last, well, what is it now? Five or six weeks you've been champion, five or six weeks since WrestleMania. And, well, you, I mean, you're the face of company. Top of Raw every week, carrying the, carrying the title around. Used to it yet? Yeah. No, I'll never get used to it. Um, I keep it by my side. Just to remind me that it's actually real. Um, but now it's an incredible opportunity. It's an opportunity I've been looking for my entire life and worked for my entire life. And this, since I won the title, one o'clock in the morning uh, that night, I've been doing whatever I could to try and uh, you know get more eyes on the product. And that's my job now as brand ambassador. I'm doing interviews like this. Um, I'm talking trash to people on social media. As you obviously know, Tyson Fury and myself got a thing going on. Colby Covington and myself, and myself a thing going on. Chris Sutton and myself have a thing going on. And it's all about getting eyes on the, the product. So I'm trying to keep myself as busy as possible to just get one extra pair of eyes to tune into WWE. But in that short amount of time, I have defended the title at least five times as much as Brock Lesnar did last year. <laughs> and having <I'm> five weeks. <laughs> and Bobby Lashley up next, of course. Another guy like Brock who's come, well, he was in WWE before and he's done MMA and he's one of these kind of legitimate, enormous, muscly, terrifying blokes. Uh, so you don't pick easy opponents, do you? No, but that's what it's all about. You know, I'll take on all different shapes and sizes and styles, um, you know, as long as they are deserving of a title shot. Um, and it's all about, for me, um, to cement myself as one of the greatest champions of all time. Obviously, Brock's one of a kind athlete, beat him in five minutes, followed up that night with the big show, obviously a giant. We've had uh, matches in between with Andrade and Garza, then my first title defense with Seth Rollins. Again, like a smaller uh, talent, just unbelievably strong and unbelievably gifted in the ring. I was able to overcome him. And now, the flip side, someone as big and dangerous as Bobby Lashley, the backlash, and that's what it's all about. You know, keeping it fresh, keeping it different, keeping me on my toes and keeping it entertaining for the WWE Universe. And also these matches, you know, they obviously, they, they get more physical up the top, don't they? And you, they're a little bit longer and a little bit more pressure. Are you starting to feel the strain yet? No, absolutely not. That's just the way, like, I, like, happily perform. I don't know if all of the superstars who wrestle me really enjoy wrestling Drew McIntyre because I'm very physical I will grab you I will throw you across the ring when you least expect it when I chop you it's going to probably leave marks for about two weeks so that's just the norm for me and the fact that you know we don't have anybody in the building right now and you can hear every strike it encourages me to hit even harder but then when you talk about someone like a Bobby Lashley you know that's somebody who's not afraid of physicality we've wrestled each other in the past a few years ago and the, I can still remember the physicality level. You know, we were both really going to town on each other um, with those strikes and just everything. My goodness, the build-up to the match, I remember what that felt like. But now, a few years later, we're in WWE. I'm the WWE champion. It was my first opportunity of the title. I won it. He's been waiting 13 years for an opportunity of the title. We're both a lot better in different places than we were back then. I think people are going to be blown away by what they see from Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley. And if Edge and Randy are going to have the greatest wrestling match ever, then Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley are going to have the greatest fight ever. That's how you sell a fight. Uh, you, you're speaking there about having to uh, maybe hit a little bit harder in the empty arenas. Do you think you've been an underrated chopper for the uh, duration of your career? Talking about, of course, the chop. Because those... Uh, those Empty arenas have really brought out the most in the Drew McIntyre chop, haven't they? 
I don't know. I mean, if you ask my opponents, they would tell you absolutely not. Um, if you ask Kurt Angle specifically, I remember the first time we wrestled years ago, he was like, like Drew, you know, I love wrestling you, but my goodness, those chops. So uh, fan-wise, I guess they've started paying more attention to it. Um, I guess what really got their attention was myself and Randy had a moment during a match a few months ago where I, we were arguing with each other and I chopped him and <laughs> echoed across the arena. And, you know, he... Uh, you know, got himself ready for another one, but then tried to hit me with one and I hit him again. And then, you know, people started talking about Drew's chops then. And myself and Walter, who had a little chop off at Survivor Series and people claimed that I won that chop off. And then I beat him with the Claymore a few minutes later. So I think people maybe are excited for the future, perhaps with the Drew McIntyre-Walter match, maybe in an empty arena. Maybe we can hear all the chops. I don't know. We're just going back and forth here, thinking on the fly. Drew McIntyre versus Walter. Triple H, set it up. UK takeover Glasgow. Boom. Money. The greatest chopping match ever. Right? Ever. <laughs> that's, that's how we do it. From a, you know, putting a match together standpoint, how are you finding, uh, especially in the position you are as, as WWE champion, how are you finding putting matches together and, and, and working on the fly out there without having the, the noise of the crowd to work off? Because that's kind of the, the meat and drink when you're coming up through the ranks, isn't it? You listen to the crowd and, and you adapt on the fly to that. How are you finding it sort of gauging the success of a promo or a match while you're out there? Um, I mean, I've been doing it for a long time. Um, and, you know, just like WWE, you know, I'm all about innovating and thinking outside the box and adapting to whatever situation um, that I happen to be in. With the matches, <clears throat> I think for me, it's about keeping the action going, you know, for grabbing like holds, et cetera, which generally will get the crowd rumbling and start, you know, firing that good guy up to start rallying the comeback. Don't really work in that environment. And, we're all still figuring it out, but for me, I think it's keeping the action, you know, fairly, fairly moving while telling that story you're trying to tell out there. Regarding the promos, you know, I think this is a unique opportunity. Again, you know, it's hard. WWE is all about storytelling and there's no crowd. You're there by yourself. It's like a movie or a TV show. You know, you're telling your story, you're getting your character over. And I think this is an interesting time for people to really get their characters over, make a connection with the fans at home because you can look down the camera. And when we get back to the arena, the fans are really going to know who each character is if they take advantage of this unique opportunity we have right now. Yeah, you mentioned the looking down the camera and that being something you're not really allowed to do in the normal circumstances. You took the opportunity no. at WrestleMania to look down the camera and, and give quite an emotional message to, to the fans. And then two weeks later, look down the camera. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. <laughs> Yep. Um, yeah, I've gone a bit wild with it. You know, I thought that would be edited. I've spoke about it a few times. You know, that's how I felt in the moment. It was really an emotional moment. I'd finally won the WWE Championship. I knew millions of people, millions and millions of people around the world were watching. And, you know, I reached out and thanked them because how I felt in the moment. Thank you for supporting me throughout my career to get to this moment. Thank you for choosing WWE during these difficult times. I found out later we had 13.9 million social media interactions over WrestleMania. You know, and during these difficult times, they chose WWE to take their mind off things. And I hopefully gave them that happy ending, which was awesome. But again, you know, since that moment on Raw, the next day and every week after, I'm trying to think, you know, what's going to catch people's attention? And again, it's my job as brand ambassador to catch uh, people's attention. I'm allowed to kind of get away with a little bit more right now. So I'm really going to go for it. And I just watched the Tiger King with the wife and it was kind of hot. Um, and my wife dared me to say, uh, hey, all you cool cats and kittens. So I was like, screw it. Like, I'm trying things right now. I'm seeing what sticks. I'm seeing what entertains the fans because that's what it's all about is entertaining the fans. I set it down the camera. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. And sure enough, everyone popped for it. It was memed. It was all over the place and it was mission accomplished. So thank you, wife. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Carol Baskin, I guess. Hey, yeah, supposed to be an F, F in there, but we've got to keep it PG. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another man who's, who's returned to WWE programming in the last couple of weeks is your old pal Jinder. Uh, obviously, oh, yeah. the internet started talking straight away about when are you two uh, going to have your big match because he obviously went away, came back, won the world title. You did it on a different time scale as well, but currently holding the title. You must see each other backstage and kind of give each other the eye and think, yeah, this is going to happen at some point, right? Yeah, I mean, I hope it's going to happen at some point because, um, you know, that's a very real story. And like I say, especially the environment we're in right now, you know, if you're able to tell a compelling story, this is the time, you know, to probably do it. 
I think Jinder just needs to get on a bit of a roll, um, you know, get some wins under his belt and remind everybody what he's capable of. You know, he won the world title, I think it was three years ago, um, pretty much to this day, that he won the world title. And since then, he's kind of been floating. And now he came back from an injury. He's in the best shape of his life. He's more focused than ever. He can rack up all those wins. And we have the opportunity, I think, to tell such a unique, compelling story, not just what people know, not what you've saw on TV with the free MB stuff, et cetera. You know, there's a lot of personal, private stuff that, you know, I my whole bloody life has been out to the world anyway, since I was 21 years old. Like, I'm not shy to put things out to the world. And I really know this story would touch people, have them emotionally invested. I think they'd be very surprised, not just by the story, but by the match. And that's my goal as champion. No matter who I'm out there with, I'm going to talk about them. I'm going to elevate them in the interviews. And I'm going to have a match that people are not expecting. I remember with Corbin even just on Raw there. I remember people, they announced it and lots of people are excited about it. And lots of other people are like, oh, goodness, like Corbin, because he does such a good job being a bad guy. Um, and we have the match. And then after the fact, I was like, that was great. I was like, weird. Just give us a chance. My goodness. But that's my goal as champion. And my job as champion is to make you care about the match and then deliver with the match. And I think people are going to be really, really surprised and invested when it comes to the Drew McIntyre ginger story. Mm. And like you mentioned, if it happens, I'm just assuming it's going to happen. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned there the, the the private life and things that went on. You both went away, and there is a real parallel in that you both sort of went away and then both came back. You know, physically different. Like gave up all the fun things <laughs> to get the I mean, three MB stuff. Was, like, was insanely <laughs> ripped, wasn't he? When he came back, and hey, you're not doing too bad yourself. Oh, cheers, pal. Uh, yeah, I mean, we just uh, you know had. You know, like I guess our epiphanies around about the same time. Like mine, when I uh, was released from WWE, I was just right away like, "What am I going to do? I'm going to hit the ground running." And I got out there and started working my butt off. And when it came to uh, Jinder, you know, he didn't take that approach. He kind of uh, stopped training for a long time, and um, I think his story is just as interesting and inspiring as mine. Like you know, I kept going, worked really hard. Eventually, got back to WWE uh, through my work outside the company, especially. You know, uh, he wasn't really doing much, got out of shape, talked about leaving wrestling at one point. I remember talking to him in a bar about it. And he was like, no, I think I'm going to give it up. Can I go into a franchise? He's a smart guy. He would have done well. And then I guess one day he looked at himself and said, this is not what I want to be. I'm going to, you know, start working out again and take this serious. And he got into routine, started seeing improvements, gave up the drinking. WWE came calling. They needed bodies because they were having a brand split. And they just said, you know, you've done TV before, basically. So that's why we're bringing you back, not because of your talent or what you've done outside the company. And he said, this is my opportunity. I'm not going to let it slip. And he continued working as hard as he could in the gym, um, you know, verbalizing himself on the promos, et cetera. And he got himself in the most ridiculous shape. And people say, oh, it's because of like this India deal or whatever. That's why I was given the opportunity. I was like, did you look at that guy? Like if, I, if I'm a bo the boss of the company and I look at somebody and go, my goodness, this guy made this incredible transformation. Look how hard he's working. If he works that hard on himself, how hard is he going to work for my company? And he got that opportunity. And when he was brought back to the company, and I tell everybody who say, like, oh, no, Drew, you've left the company. You did all this and brought back. That's why you got these opportunities. I say, okay, well, that was my path. But Jinder got brought back just as a body and did it within the system. So if there's anybody out there frustrated right now thinking, you know, woe is me. I think I'll complain on social media. Maybe take the Jinder approach. Work your butt off. Maybe you'll just be world champion one day, you know, like he was. For the story purposes, when he won the title, people weren't exactly over the moon about it. Um, you know, they were just like, my goodness, I can't believe you got the title so quick. Um, and there's a story there, like the way people reacted to him winning the championship compared to when I won the championship, it was kind of universally praised. I think, like, when it comes to that story depth, there's a lot to go into. I don't want to give it all away because we're just kind of talking about it out loud right now, and I'm probably giving away <laughs> half the story. <laughs> I mean, his discipline is crazy as well. We, we interviewed him uh, about the time BT and WWE signed the deal together. We, we did an interview with him. And you know, I, I don't know the, specific, uh, the specifics of diet and nutrition, Drew. I don't want to surprise you. But uh, to me, it sounded like he basically hasn't eaten like a piece of bread for two years. Yeah, he's a machine. Like he sticks to it absolutely to the letter. You know, for me personally, I'm not trying to look like I'm about to walk on the stage for uh, Mr. Olympia or anything. Uh, my, like, the way I see myself, Drew McIntyre, is the big, hairy, uh, aggressive Scotsman. Um, so, you know, I'll be big, I'll be powerful, I'll be muscular, but I'm not trying to have the, the 12 pack or whatever. So I will have a cheat meal here and there and every day, pretty much. My metabolism's through the roof, so I got to eat a lot, but he's an animal when it comes to diet. He will not deviate whatsoever, no matter how much I'll put a pizza his way or whatever. It's not for him. 
You've had uh, Tyson mentioning your your physique on his on his workout videos, haven't you? You know he does his daily workout videos. Oh. Yeah. He wants you to go on there and uh, show off the show off the guns, doesn't he? All right, I'll get on there. I'll get on there with him. You know, that's the like cool thing about this interaction myself and you know Tyson. You know, he's somebody that's been worked with WWE and he gets it. You know, he understands WWE. Um, you know, it's such a big company, a global company, on in eight hundred million homes, hundred and eighty countries, twenty different languages, over a billion with a B social media followers, and he knows it's good for his brand. Um, you know, and he's like worked really hard when he was here. So that's somebody that I'm happily to be having a back happy to be having a back and forth with getting more eyes on the product and hopefully one day we'll be able to do some business together. The way I see it is I really want to make this UK pay-per-view happen and it's going to happen one way or another. I am going to make it my absolute mission and I am making it my absolute mission. And one day we're going to have a big UK pay-per-view, the level of SummerSlam 92. And if it takes McIntyre versus Fury in a battle of Britain to get the attention we need, then that's what's going to happen. As simple as that. But Fury, I'll work out with you, pal. <laughs> People are talking about sports personality this year over here in Britain. And obviously the, the sport has been interrupted a little bit this year, but you still found time with the first four months of the year to go and do two things a British person has never done. Obviously winning the Royal Rumble and winning the WWE title. Uh, we've already mentioned Tyson, who I think would probably be your rival in, uh, in the competition. But what's your thoughts on, on the sports personality? That must be something you're eyeing up now. You must be thinking of the, uh, getting that in the open top bus parade. Yeah, I mean, just the idea of like a, a wrestler even been mentioned in the conversation for sports personality of the years, it's just absolutely insane to me. I mean, uh, one, it truly shows the global reach of WWE. And for people back home, you know, I'm uh, obviously the first British Royal Rumble winner and the first British WWE champion. And for those who know, you know that's pretty cool. Um, but for those who don't know and are a little like, hmm, that's weird. A wrestler would even be considered for a sports personality of the year. You know, that's the ones that hopefully if I get the chance to talk about it, I can talk about, you know, why it is, um, you know, significant and something that is giving people an escape, especially uh, right now. I mean, realistically, there's hundreds of football teams to make it to. If you want to be a footballer, a lot of rugby teams you can hopefully sign for to make it as a rugby player. But realistically, when I was coming up, there was one, wrestling company to make it to. I came from a small place in Scotland, and near Scotland, with big dreams, and no one had ever been signed from Scotland. And I was lucky enough not just to get signed, have a good career, but not fulfill my potential, get fired, and squall my way up to the top of the mountain uh, to become WWE champion. And the fact that my story is having such a real impact on people, you know, that's what's real. You know, they're messaging me constantly saying, no, Drew, we're really inspired by the fact that you chased your dream, you wouldn't give up and you overcame all the obstacles and achieved your dream. And that's really touched me and that's really inspiring. And that is, for those who don't necessarily watch wrestling, have their opinions, you know, that's what's real. You know, the charity work, the WWE do, et cetera. That's what's real. Um, and if I can even be mentioned in the conversation, never mind get a nomination for something like Sports Personality of the Year, you know, I'll <laughs> explain to people, like the naysayers, exactly why, um, you know, wrestling deserves an opportunity to be heard and hopefully I can change a little bit of people's you know perceptions of our industry and obviously the opportunity to practice the uh, the Wallace two lines if you get to do the uh, the acceptance speech I see a tuxedo with a kilt on the bottom and really Scottishing oh. up the accent right oh 100 percent and then Fury and I getting a little Barney it sets up the big match in the Battle of Britain at the first UK pay-per-view <laughs> Boom. Boom. I love it. We booked it. We've done it. Oh. I'll ring up the guys at Sports oh, Personality it. now. Get Tyson on the yeah. phone. We'll sort it all. You, yeah. you sort out Vince. <laughs> yep, right. Gary Lineker. You better put my name forward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, let's shift down a little bit to... Uh, on the network, there's been the, the Big Undertaker documentary that's been uh, you know, promoted massively the last couple of weeks and is going down so well so much that people haven't ever seen uh of, of undertaker the man as well as the character before uh I, I think you guys had a tag match maybe a year or two ago right but have you ever when you look at that and you look at him as a, a locker room leader and and it is obviously a certain honor to be able to have the singles match with him do you reckon 
there's time for you to maybe sneak yourself in as a, a last chapter of the last ride? I hope so. Um, uh, interesting story from back in the day. Um, again, I don't know if I've ever spoken about this publicly, so I could be giving you exclusives here. Um, but he seems happy to put his life out there now. You know, I remember the days when cameras came backstage and he would say, F off. So it's bizarre for me to see him, uh, you know, be so comfortable on camera and tell his amazing story. He's such an inspiration when it comes to work ethic for me. Uh, but when I was 24, I was told by Vincent Mann, you know, you don't listen to anybody but The Undertaker. You know, he's going to be like your mentor. And whenever you've got a question, you go straight to him. And the inevitable goal was to have a big match between him and I. Unfortunately, no, I wasn't ready at the time. Things worked out the way they worked out. And I believe it led to, instead of myself and Undertaker, Shawn Michaels and Undertaker, the retirement match, which is obviously a phenomenal match. And I could not have delivered on that level at the time. A lot of time passed. And eventually I got the opportunity to have the tag match with myself and uh, Shane McMahon versus Undertaker and Roman after the Goldberg match. And our goal was to make sure we give him a match that he deserves and everybody worked their butt off. And you've got someone like a Shane and a Roman and an Undertaker in there, you know, no matter what, it's going to go well, but it went extra well. And he was moving around great. He was very happy after the fact. And I think I might have dropped into a conversation about there was a certain match you know, I was promised about 10 years ago. And I've got my list of things that I've returned to WWE to do. Obviously, number one was win the championship, which I've done. Wrestle The Undertaker, after seeing him at WrestleMania and how good he looked, is up there. And I know he's capable of doing it. And I want it to happen before he rides off for that last time into the sunset. Now you've got the, the WWE championship. You're, you're, the, you know, you're the face of Raw. Do you see that that kind of locker room leader role that he talks so much about in the documentary. Do you see that that is kind of on your shoulders now? I don't think there's anybody quite like The Undertaker, the way, you know, you just knew he was the guy. But we have a few people that have been around for a long time, a lot of experience uh, that people will look to. And, you know, whenever anybody's got a question, which, you know, happens frequent, I am happy to answer them and help them out. And, you know, you see someone like a Roman, you know, he's somebody um, who, around the locker room, you see him come in and, you know, his presence, et cetera, and, you know, how quick he's absorbed so much information in sh such a short career. You know, he's definitely somebody I look at and go, you know, that's a leader right there. But I think now we more have a few individuals uh, that the younger talent can look up to than somebody like The Undertaker. Because he, I was in the locker room with him and traveled around the world with him, and there's nobody quite like him. Um, and again, you're getting to see what I saw back then. It's incredible for me to relive. And that's the part of the mentality I have now is watching these incredible superstars with these incredible work ethics, like a John Cena when it comes to in-ring and media, et cetera, and The Undertaker. I watched him in so much pain, travel the world. Wouldn't show it, you could see it. Like it was impossible not to limp. And I'd see him get put together before the matches and he would wrestle just as hard in front of nobody um, with no kid, I'd say nobody. It was never a small show when the Undertaker was around, but with no cameras were there, he would wrestle equally as hard as he would with those cameras there. And I watched that, I you know, took it to heart. Like if the Undertaker is gonna get himself put together, move around backstage till he can feel comfortable to go to that ring, give them 100%, when he's in this amount of pain, I can certainly do it. And it really had a profound effect on me and the world's getting to see you know, exactly what I saw back in the day. This is somebody that will give every last ounce of energy and everything that his body can possibly give just for the fans. And I think you did uh, mention in an interview before, when you were on SmackDown, I believe, with Undertaker, when they did the, the brand split initially, what, 10 years ago or something now, he was one of the people there that was saying, let's be the best show, let's be Raw, let's yep. do this. Has that carried on until now? Because I know that it's, it's not quite the same as it was, the brand split, but it's still different networks, it's still different shows. Do you still have that kind of attitude that you want to be the must-watch segment or the, the must-watch show of the week. Of course. Of course, absolutely. Uh, I remember those days and they were cool, like especially in the UK tours, etc. You know, we would find out, you know, how many people they had at the show and what the, you know, the gate was, how much money they made for the show. We'd compare it to ours throughout. And I remember one particular Raw versus SmackDown tour and Raw was seen, you know, as they show at the time, I was with SmackDown at the time and we won at the end of that tour and it was a big celebration. There was that camaraderie and it was so cool. And now, these days, I feel exactly the same. You know, obviously, 
SmackDown is on Fox, which is uh, more available, uh, sorry, available in more homes, etc. But I see it as exactly the same. You know, I believe in our talent. Um, and we're working, you know, as hard as we possibly can. I think we've got a little ways to go and we start establishing like so many of our new talented characters and in time we're going to absolutely take over them. And I know we are. And I see it as, like you say, a little battle between Royal Royal versus SmackDown, USA versus Fox, however you want to see it. And I hope the rest of the roster see it that way too because if you don't, you really don't belong in my roster. Speaking of little battles, uh, I'm going to draw your attention to the Scottish Premier League. Uh, yeah. Bad news for you as a Rangers fan this week, right? Nine in a row for Celtic, handed the victory. That that doesn't happen with Raw and SmackDown. No one gets handed that, do they? How do you feel about that? No, no, no. <laughs> um, I, I mean, like, no matter what I say, it's going to come across as always a Rangers fan if I say how I really feel. But I, I did lay out the situation to my wife, who's not a football fan and she's not really a big wrestling fan either i actually get most of my opinions from her as somebody who doesn't watch wrestling regularly i laid out the situation of what happened in the scottish league and she said well that's not really fair is it but it's not really fair um you know the french league is over because second place couldn't possibly have caught a uh, paris saint germain um but when it regards to the scottish league you know it was possible for rangers to come back it wasn't likely um, but it was possible, and because of that fact, they should have just played out the rest of the league like every other leagues, and Celtic would have had their nine in a row. It's very unlikely we would have caught them, but now there's going to be, you know, that that question and that little asterisk beside it. So like nine of a row, nine in a row, kind of, and then ten in a row. I mean, but kind of because of that nine in a row. Like if we played it out, they probably would have won, and then it would be like nine in a row officially, then ten in a row maybe officially. But yeah, we'll see what happens next season now. But no, I don't think it was the right. And, and, and everyone's going to see his bias, and then I'm sure Sutton's going to talk crap to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sutton would never talk crap to anyone. Come on. I've seen him go to me online already. That tweet was for me. He was trying to get me to reply. <laughs> the, the, the shrinking violet, uh, Chris Sutton, never. I won't believe it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, keep... yeah, yeah. I've told him already when I get back to Scotland, like, you know, claims he loves Scotland so much. I've got a great big Glasgow kiss for him when I see him. <laughs> Keeping it in uh, Britain, we, we've been talking a little bit this week about, uh, or the last couple of weeks, basically since William Regal's birthday, about the, the Mount Rushmore of uh, British wrestling. Do you, so basically, you know, your top four British wrestlers of all time. Yeah, yeah. I live in America, I know what Mount Rushmore is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. I mean, I'm sure you've probably seen it, Drew. But <laughs> what, what do you uh, reckon your, your, Mount, uh, your Mount Rushmore is of the, of the British wrestling world? And you don't worry, because you're the first WWE champion from Britain, you're allowed to put yourself in there. No, no, I wouldn't put myself in there. That's for other people to do. But I wouldn't put myself <laughs> in there. Mason and I were talking about this the other day, about some people who are a little deluded in the UK scene, who constantly refer to themselves as legends, who aren't legends at all. And I told them, the way I look at it is, I've been around for a long time, and I've been very fortunate to win titles across the world, make a difference to the UK scene, the first... British Royal Rumble winner, first British champion, but I wouldn't put myself in there right now or consider myself in that status right now. I'm a work in progress. And then there's a lot of deluded people back home. Um, nonetheless, some names. Uh, I mean, Bulldog, Regal, Rocco, Big Daddy, drawing the houses back in the day. Um, Who are you pondering here? You're struggling to commit to one, aren't you? I think Big Daddy and Bulldog are easy, right? And William Regal is probably easy. So it's yeah. that fourth one that's difficult. <sighs> All right, for right now, we'll, we'll say Roll About Rocco. Yeah. Just for that, yeah, it's such a unique ahead of his time style. Um, and he was able to go to Japan, obviously, and have those incredible matches <clears throat> over there because he just was ahead of his time when it came to in-ring style. So we'll give him the nod for now. And I'll think about it later on. I'll be like, ah, I should have put this guy here. This guy here. <laughs> William Regal will be pleased with you. There's not a conversation with Regal where he doesn't go back to the Rollable, Rollable Rocco match from, what, 78, I think. He mentions it every I mean, time, doesn't he? Every match, like Rocco, just if you look at it, and especially in the context of the time, it's just unreal. And I love hearing Regal's stories about what he was like backstage, just beyond damped up. I don't know much as we talked about publicly. Let's just say he was pacing around like, <sighs> like, I'm like, goodness, I don't want to wrestle this guy. He's like a psycho. But, you know, he brought that physicality and that intensity to the ring, which I really appreciate. 
All right, Andrew. And, and just before we wrap up, obviously there's been uh, the really, really sad news over the last couple of days about the passing of Shad Gaspar. I know you were on the roster at, at the same time uh, in your first run. I was wondering if you've, if you've got any words, any, any tributes for the man, because we, we hear so much about uh, what, a, you know, what, a top, like, what a top guy he was. So I was just wondering if, if you've got any words about him. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it really sucks. Um, you know, he was just a good person. Like, I've never met Shad one time where he didn't have a big smile on his face. And it was genuine. He hugged you and it was genuine. And you could feel that. And I just feel so much for, you know, his wife and kid. Um, and those so close to him, it really, he's so young. Um, but the way everybody, you know, is reacting shows you what kind of, kind of person he truly was, and um, his last actions shows you what kind of man he really was. You know, making sure <clears throat> that his kid was okay. So we lost a good brother. Uh, but I know I'll see him down the line, and I'm just thinking about his family and his close friend right now. Well said, and, and obviously the thoughts of everyone at BT with his family as well. And there's nothing but positive things being said about him. Like so many stories of, of what a good guy he's been online. Uh, yeah, so obviously really, really sad news. But, um, you know, it seems a shame to end on that note. But Drew, it's been lovely to talk to you. Always is. You're a, you're a fine ambassador, a, a great brand ambassador, as you keep putting yourself. And, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing. It's... Uh, mental health week over here, mental health awareness week over here. And I was talking to Kofi last week or a week, week or two ago about the, the role that WWE have played in, you know, keeping a bit of normality in people's lives, putting something on TV to put a smile on pe people's faces. And obviously you're, you're playing your part in that. So keep going, uh, keep entertaining and keep doing those Tiger King references down the camera. Appreciate that, buddy. You know, thank you to you all at BT Sport. You know, um, you guys have been absolutely incredible you know, with yourself and Sam and the team. Um, you know, I just can't believe, you know, how much effort uh, you really are putting into the product and how much you believe in WWE. And uh, we want to return it in kind. And when we get that UK pay-per-view, it's going to be because we work together to make it happen. So thank you all at BT Sport. Oh, emotional. It's true. <laughs> Thank you, Trey. Top man. Thank you, brother.